There was an interesting connection between the rise of fascism in Europe and the consciousness of politically radical people about corporate power uh, because there was a recognition that fascism rose in Europe with the help of enormous corporations. Mussolini was greatly admired all across the spectrum. Business loved him. Investment shot up. And suddenly when Hitler came in in Germany, the same thing happened there. Investment shot up in Germany. He had the workforce under control. He was getting rid of dangerous left-wing elements. Investment opportunities were improving. There was no problems. These are wonderful countries. I think one of the greatest untold stories of the 20th century is the collusion between corporations, especially in America, and Nazi Germany. First, in terms of how the corporations from America helped to essentially rebuild Germany and support the early Nazi regime. And then, when the war broke out, figured out a way to keep everything going. So General Motors was able to keep Opel going, Ford was able to keep their thing going, and companies like Coca-Cola they couldn't keep the coca-cola going so what they did was they invented fanta orange for the germans and that's how coke was able to keep their profits coming in to coca-cola so when you drink fanta orange that's the nazi drink that was created so that coke could continue making money while millions of people died when hitler came to power in 1933 his goal was to dismantle and destroy the Jewish community. This was an enterprise so fast that it required the resources of a computer. But in 1933, there was no computer. What there was was the IBM punch card system, which controlled and stored information based upon the holes that were punched in various rows and columns. Naturally, there was no off-the-shelf software as there is today. Each application was custom designed and the engineer had to personally configure it. Millions of people of all religions and nationalities and characteristics went through the concentration camp system. That's an extraordinary traffic management program that required an IBM system in every railroad direction and an IBM system in every concentration camp. Now, this is a typical prisoner card. There are little boxes where all the information is to be punched in. We compare this information to the code sheet for concentration camps. And here you see Auschwitz is one, Buchenwald two, Dachau is three. Now, what kinds of prisoners were they? They could be a Jehovah's Witness for two, a homosexual for three, communist for six, or a Jew would be eight. Now, what was their status? One was released, two was transferred, Four was executed, five was suicide, and six. Code six, Sonderbehandlung, special treatment, meant the gas chamber or sometimes a bullet. They would punch that number in, the material was tabulated, the machines were set, and of course, the punch cards by the millions had to be printed, and they were printed exclusively by IBM, and the profits were recovered just after the war. It should not surprise us that corporate allegiance to profits will trump their allegiance to any flag. A recent U.S. Treasury Department report revealed that in one week alone, 57 U.S. corporations were fined for trading with official enemies of the United States, including terrorists, tyrants, and despotic regimes. You can roughly locate any community somewhere along a scale running all the way from democracy to despotism. This man makes it his job to study these things. Well, for one thing, avoid the comfortable idea that the mere form of government can of itself safeguard a nation against despotism. For big business, Despotism was often a useful tool for securing foreign markets and pursuing profits. One of the U.S. Marine Corps' most highly decorated generals, Smedley Darlington Butler, by his own account, helped pacify Mexico for American oil companies. 
Haiti and Cuba for National City Bank, Nicaragua for the Brown Brothers Brokerage, the Dominican Republic for sugar interests, Honduras for U.S. fruit companies, and China for Standard Oil. General Butler services were also in demand in the United States itself in the 1930s, as President Franklin Delano Roosevelt sought to relieve the misery of the Depression through public enterprise and tougher regulations on corporate exploitation and misdeeds. More power to you, President Roosevelt. The entire country's behind you, thrilled with hope and patriotism. But the country was not entirely behind the populist president. Large parts of the corporate elite despised what Roosevelt's New Deal stood for. And so, in 1934, a group of conspirators sought to involve General Butler in a treasonous plan. The plan as outlined to me was to form an organization of veterans, to use as a bluff or as a club at least, to intimidate the government. But the corporate cabal had picked the wrong man. Butler was fed up with being what he called a gangster for capitalism. I appeared before the Congressional Committee, the highest representation of the American people under subpoena to tell what I knew of activities, which I believe might lead to an attempt to set up a fascist dictatorship. The upshot of the whole thing was that I was supposed to lead an organization of 500,000 men, which would be able to take over the functions of government. A Congressional Committee ultimately found evidence of a plot to overthrow Roosevelt. According to Butler, the conspiracy included representatives of some of America's top corporations, including J.P. Morgan, DuPont, and Goodyear Tire. As today's chairman of Goodyear Tire knows, for corporations to dominate government, a coup is no longer necessary. Corporations have gone global. And by going global, the uh, governments have lost some control over corporations, regardless of whether the corporation can be trusted or cannot be trusted. Governments today do not have over the corporations the power that they had and the leverage that they had 50 or 60 years ago. And that's a major change. So governments have become powerless compared to where they were before. Capitalism today commands the towering heights and has displaced politics and politicians as the new high priests and reigning oligarchs of our system. So capitalism and its principal protagonists and players, corporate CEOs, have been accorded unusual power and access. This is not to deny the significance of government and politicians, but these are the new high priests. I was invited to Washington, D.C. to attend this meeting that was being put together by the National Security Agency called the Critical Thinking Consortium. I remember standing there in this room and looking over on one side of the room, and we had CIA, NSA, DIA, FBI, Customs, Secret Service. Uh, and then on the other side of the room, we had Coca-Cola, Mobile Oil, GTE, and Kodak. And I remember thinking, I am like in the epicenter of the intelligence industry right now. I mean, the line is not just blurring, it's just not there anymore. And to me, it, it spoke volumes as to how industry and government were consulting with each other and working with each other 